Hi folks and welcome to Think Bowling. Today we're going to sit down with Mo Pinnell and find out more about his time in the industry. So let's bring Mo on and learn more. Hi Mo Pinnell. How you doing? Uh, all right. Uh, just want to talk to you today about some of the stuff you've done in the bowling industry. Obviously you're a, a big person in the bowling industry. You've been around for a while. Uh, designed a variety. I've been around a long time. Okay. Okay. I don't want to say it, but you can. Big person. <laughs> so. You got started in the bowling industry. Can you can you go back about a little bit on that detail? Well, I birth, first got interested in in bowling technology back in the '70s because with an engineering background at Cornell, uh, and then I got involved in bowling in uh, about '71, and I won a lot of money at '72. And then I started looking at things. Yeah, I see the King so of Bowling just published an article on you. It. And it took me from 72 till 89 before I got hooked up. And we started doing things together with different companies. Yeah. So I saw uh, USBC has March of 91 is the shark. Was that the first um, core that you did with yes. track? Uh, I did with Phil Cardinale. Uh, he got in touch with me because he he was doing something else, and then uh, Paul C got sued, Dick Haas, and ended up with all the Star Trek balls. Okay. So <laughs> Phil was working for Paul C. Got at the time doing some accounting, and uh, he said, "Come on, let me see, let me." help you get rid of all that bowling balls you got. So I ran into him. He was in the Cleveland area at the time. And we started talking, and I was just getting done with what I was doing on my resurfacing career because I managed the world's largest resurfacing business. My partner and I had it resurfaced yep. by us from yep. 82 until 92. So we were doing that, and I said, okay, let's do some things. And he was, he was having stuff made he was going to have stuff made at columbia for track it was star trek at the time yeah and he turned yeah. it into track incorporated and then he and i did it together and we tested a ball in fact we tested it at uh, olympic bowl in rochester and we tested it with his staff and the test went very well and the next thing you know the track the shark was on the market okay and Started then you, with the navy blue one with the pink lettering, it was a urethane yeah. ball. Yeah, and then you left and went and did the sumo with AMF. Yes, while I was doing that, then AMF and Ebonite came to me and said, "Well, Ebonite was trying to get AMF's business, and AMF yeah. was big at the time because they had just had the Cobra. Yeah, the Cobra was a uh, was big for a long time in the late eighties. A monster." And, uh, they had been doing that, and uh, Bill Supper was working for Ebonite at the time, and he just uh, said, uh, well, AMF said to him, he says, Bill, you want our business? Why don't you hook up with Mo Pinnell and present us with the ball? So I got together with them. That's where I met Randy Tightloff, because he had just gone to work for Ebonite at the time. Yeah. And now we're back yeah. together again at Brunswick. <laughs> That's only uh, 30 years later. Yeah. So it's amazing small. how things do come around and turn around and come back again. So yeah, small we did industry. that, and then we did the sumo, and then the next thing you know, there we go. Sumos yeah. and ninjas, yeah. ninja furies and masters. Uh, then we started getting into asymmetry, and we went with, well, we had the, uh, Bobby Learn broke the record on TV with the AMF uh, RPM? Uh, ninja RPM. Pearl, yeah. right? Yeah. And then we went from that into the excesses. In fact, Bobby Learn was almost, Bobby Learn and I have been around for a long time. I met him. Well, he came to me when I won a tournament back in 1979 in Erie, Pennsylvania. And he said, how'd you do that with that big hole in the side? And how'd you get from, how'd you run the run the step lap? <laughs> so I showed him how to drill balls, used putting a, a balance hole right on your, on your positive axis point because things weren't flaring at that time. So yeah. Mr. 300 yeah. and I have been together since he was like, 
I don't know, 14 or 15 or 16 years old. <laughs> so we did that. And then he, uh, then, uh, he almost won bowl of the year in 96 with a pro access one and two. We were doing that. And then, uh, Ebonite and AMF decided they didn't need us and they were going to do it on their own and save their $3 a ball without having to pay us. My partner and I, Rich Saddles and I, we've been partners since 87. And then uh, Dennis Baldwin at Fabball called us up and called me up and said, how about designing a ball for me? So I go to Baltimore and who do I run into up there? Wes Pye who's now working and managing uh, 900 Global. Yep. So Wes yep. was there and he says, yeah, we want to do balls. And then I said, well, you got any ideas? And I slapped some things together out of some green cores and we started throwing them. And we, Wes and I, with a guy by the name of Robbie Sapp, who was the lab technician there, did the original 3D in 52 hours. In fact, I had, I had to fix Wes's grip so they could bowl enough in those 52 hours so he could actually come up with a ball because he was tearing his <laughs> hand up. And I said, forget that. Let's go fix your grip first. <laughs> so Wes and I, all these people, we all get together once in a while. And we did yeah. that and then yeah. it was the 3D. And then nah, we moved. Then I moved the puck to the side, the body to the side instead of the, the blocks on the top. And the next thing you know, we had the 3D offset. And here we go, as you yeah. know. In 1997, every ball return in the United States had one of them purple balls, at least one of them purple balls on it. Yeah, for and sure. And that's where it was, and that's how we got to where we are. Uh, then Dennis, then Fabball was having a little problems, and they ended up being sold to Ebonite. And then uh, Phil Cardinale was running track for Columbia at the time, and then he came to my partner, and I said, we need another ball line. We need to manufacture some balls, and Morich started. Then we started with the Labyrinth and the Colossus. Then we kept right on going with the Morich balls. So it basically just wanders through life, and here we go. <laughs> so backwards it's a little bit. Story. Yeah, very, yeah. very interesting. Uh, the White Excess, uh, was that asymmetrical? Yes. Was it a strong Actually, asymmetrical? Actually, no. The White, X, the white Excess... Yes, was asymmetrical. The okay. numbers were 027, 050. Wow. Okay. And here we are in 2022, and we're doing the results, and the numbers are 027, 044. <laughs> totally different shape. Yeah, but that's that's when asymmetry started. The white yeah. excess was the yeah. first, and I have – I had – 15 memos at AMF don't make it white. And then we made it purple and we made it black. And then that's where it, that's where it started. And that turned out to be uh, the thinking that went into where the 3D offset came from. Okay. So, yeah. So we just kind of, we were hot rodders in those days. Because I'd done a <laughs> lot of hot rodding when I was a kid. I had a world record holder, holder degasser when I was 14 years old. So I've wow. just been, you know, just let's let's do a few things. I mean, let's not sit here and just sit on our hands and talk about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, tell me, tell me your involvement with the armadillo. Oh, that was 1992. I was. Uh, I realized that a ball track was nothing more than a plane intersecting a sphere. So I had a napkin in a bar, and I was sitting there talking to a bunch of people, and I said. Why don't we do this? To this day, that is the fastest product to pay back the research or the, the manufacturer because yeah. we it paid yeah. for itself in three weeks. <laughs> took three weeks, and, and we ended up paying for everything we had to do with the molding because the big deal in the expense in the armadillo was you had to polish the mold to make it clear. So we had twenty. So AMF had twenty-two thousand invested in, in uh, polishing the mold, but it paid for itself. It paid for itself in three weeks. It's still a record. Wow. Yeah. Because you know you yeah. you figure all your expenses, and when you're doing a product, you say, "What's my payback time?" Well, payback time yeah. on the armadillo yeah. was three weeks. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. Chris Keller was at AMF at the time, 
And Chris Keller and I and my partner did that together. And Chris is up on Long Island now, and you guys are up in the Northeast. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a, so, I'm a Brooklyn kid by nature. So, the, um, I mean, the armadillo is still around. It's still really, really popular in the industry. It's amazing. We're still selling them. We're yeah. still selling them. And uh, uh, Turbo and uh, Innovative Bowling both still sell them. And we get orders, and we've got somebody making them for us. So we yeah. get orders, and we're still selling armadillos. Yeah. Yeah. I, and and I always found this interesting was the fact that it still says AMF on it to this day. Yes, it does, because it's in the original mold, and we have the mold. <laughs> Still says AMF on it, but it you know that's that's uh, thirty years ago. Yeah, and people that don't realize 90- how. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I just don't think people realize how big of a uh, of a bowling company AMF was at that time. Yeah, when AMF, well, the fastest selling ball we ever did the sumo. Yeah, and it's the biggest selling ball I've ever done. We did one hundred ninety three thousand sumos. Wow. But the life cycle of a bowling ball in those days was a year and a half. The life yeah. cycle of a bowling ball today is until somebody comes out with something else. <laughs> it was a it's different true. world. Yes. yes, yes. So yeah, that, you think... That's still the biggest seller of all. Even outsold the 3D offset. 3D offset, we only sold 173,000 wow. of those. Wow. So do you think today in today's market, like if you brought back an XS or a 3D offset with modern cover stock, do you think that, that would they would be just as good as they were then? Nope. The new designs good that answer. we've been doing now are a whole lot more technical and a whole lot more detailed. We've learned a lot about manufacturing bowling balls and designing them. I'm yeah. fortunate enough. Uh, I've got a CAD designer that does my work for me. When I was at uh, Evanite, when I was at doing the sumo, Bert Shemwell yep. did it for me yep. at Ebonite. And he'd been, he, in fact, he was there until they closed the doors. He worked for Randy Titloff. And then uh, now I've got Steve Freshour. We call him Stevie Fresh. He's got a master's in applied mathematics from LSU. And he does all my CAD work for me. And then we send the designs for Brunswick to Brunswick and then they take care of it and make sure it's compatible with their processes and turn it into the the uh, details they need to make the molds and make the balls. Yeah. So it goes and from our CAD stuff with Stevie Fresh and I goes to uh, AMF. AMF just hired a kid that I know to be their new ball designer now that they got seven brands. Kid's name is Brian Buckosh. He grew up in a bowling center in uh, Vermilion, Ohio. His dad owned a little 18 laner. So I've known the kid since he was seven years old. And he okay. was doing other things and trying to, and he finally got his dream job. Went up there and interviewed with Brian Graham, and Brian Graham says, well, you can get a job or you want a career. I'll give you a career. Yeah. So I've known him <laughs> since he was a kid. And, yeah, he's now working for Brunswick and doing the designing with the new, with the new brands they brought in. He and Aaron Cook oh. do the actual work to make sure they're compatible with the molding process and the manufacturing. Okay. And Randy awesome. Tidloff is back now. Yeah. It's a small yeah. world. <laughs> the bowling industry is very small. Oh my God. It's very incestuous too. <laughs> Just because yeah. we used to have a joke. Jim Maylander was alive. Rest his soul. He's gone now. And we used to have a joke at the trade shows. I said, if you want to get into the trade shows, you have to, put a shirt in the corner for goodwill for every company you worked for to get here. (laughs) And there were some guys who would have had 12, 13 or 14 shirts. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely bounces around. So I guess it does. Well, you're, you guys are in new England, right? (laughs) Yep. Yep. That's what you're working out of. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, You can tell there's enough there. And I got Tim Gillick with me now. Yep. Yep. He's doing a great (laughs) job. He's doing, he does great reviews and uh ball testing so he's very compatible with what we're doing i'm enjoying working with timmy awesome awesome so tell me about the cavity uh core design that you designed for uh mo rich balls oh that was 
way back when we did uh, way back when, and that's still there. That's still there because you create different vectors when you use a cavity type design. So everything is like a shell. And then we had some legal legal things we had some fun with on that cavity design stuff. And if you look at our stuff now, it's not cavity because we horizontally seam. But if you check the distribution of masses, we're still doing the same thing. Okay. It, it, Interesting. Interesting. It creates different inertia tensors. And in, because what most people don't understand in making a bowling ball is that core shape determines motion. Yes, yes. Cover stocks are tires. Yes. So that tells you when the ball slows down and what you're doing. But the shape of the ball going down the lane is totally determined by the core design. Because the yes. vectors that you generate and the inertia tensors that you generate in the in the core design is what does it. Then you make it suitable and compatible with the lane by how you handle the tire. And tires are important because that's when the ball slows down. Yeah, for sure. We're doing some new stuff with uh, with tires right now. We've got the textured pearl, and you have just beginning to see what textured pearl can do. Yeah, yeah. Because that's in the results. Theory. Yeah, theory and, and results. Uh, conspiracy the, theory. Uh, conspiracy theory. Yeah. The first place we yeah. saw it. Yeah. So most, I mean, I don't know that a lot of people know most. You have. A, a lot of patents on on core design and stuff in in the bowling industry, and I don't know that we've many other people I have, do. I have we've had a few, but currently yeah. I don't have any that are in effect, because the life cycle of a patent is twenty years, and my last patent expired on August eighteenth of two thousand and eighteen. Okay, and that was the last one. So there aren't any patents around because life cycles of balls are so short. And with the patent office now <laughs> and the cost of doing a patent, you, yeah. you couldn't afford the bowling balls if I did patents on all of them. Yeah. So yeah. we use what, it. in a lot yeah. of industries what they call trade secrets. If they can't figure out how you did it, that's where you are. <laughs> Coca-Cola didn't patent until people started to figure it out. They were a trade secret for 60 years. And patents are only so twenty years, two yeah. seven year to, yeah. two seven years and a six. Okay, did not know that. <laughs> oh yeah, so it, and and as fast as we go through ball designs today, patenting would drive it nuts. But I'm a glad I'm a good thing we had that last patent because the uh, last two years we've seen some compensation due to uh, patent infringements and things. So we have some fun. Yeah, I kind of know what boy you're talking now. about. Everything's good. Yeah. How many of us are there actually in this industry doing bowling balls and ball technology? How many are there really? Two. Two. There's only two companies left. Yeah, for the most we, part. We I got mean, seven brands, and and uh, Storm's got three. And then there's some loonies trying to make stuff in, the, in Washington. <laughs> So it's one core, go ahead. Yes, for sure. Uh, one core design that, that uh, you think that just never caught on that you wish would have. As fast as they go through today, you're building one off the other. So we have, we right after we did the pandemic hit, I was yep. in Baton Rouge, Louisiana when the world ceased. So I had to drive 1150 miles to get home to start this thing we're going through now, this pandemic and this quarantine that we're going through. And the first thing I did when I got home is I got in touch with my CAD designer and we knocked off about six years worth of designs. And each one wow. is built off what you learned from the previous one. So it just keeps it just keeps feeding new ideas. You try it, you see how it rolls, you take a look at what you create. We've got some equations we write and some things we do that are proprietary. And uh, you just keep building. Wow, interesting, very interesting. How does how does core design how do core ideas come to you? On a napkin, you've heard that story, <laughs> I'm sure. 
you can ask Del Warren or Chuck Gardner or a few other people that there are, or Jerry Francomano, and there <laughs> there are napkins that have shapes on them. Okay. So I yeah, guess I, cocktails I, yeah. have something. I guess have cocktails have something to do with feeding the <laughs> intelligence or the creativity of the mind. Okay. I learned that okay. when I was in school at Cornell. <laughs> okay. Just uh, just, I was always curious about that. You know, like where how people come up with core design ideas, like shapes and stuff like that. And when you see something that's completely original or different, like where that comes from. You I know? don't know how anybody else does it, but uh, I used to have a little disc I had, and I'd put a paper doll in the disc, and then I'd start rotating it to look at it from every axis and, and chopping things off. And when I chopped it off and it looked like that's what I wanted, that's where we started. Okay. It doesn't and, sound and very scientific, but when you do that, there, I mean, there's two CAD programs that we use. We use SolidWorks and some people use Creo, which was originally Pro-E. That's what Columbia used. And that's what Ebonite used. But And I, I believe Storms used the SolidWorks too. It's very easy to work with. And you just start yeah. making them and start chopping them and start making sure that your gross weights and, and mass properties, your diffs and your RGs are in the right place and you just work on them. <clears throat> and then it's, it's, last it's question. Tinkering. Yeah, it's definitely, hot definitely. I was a hot rodder <laughs> in, when I was 14 and it's hot rodding. So uh, is there is there any core that you've you've – come up with the, that can be manufactured. It wasn't, it wasn't possible to manufacture a core like what you come up with. Well, when you come up with some ideas, then you got to look at seaming and part and where you seam the parts together and everything else like that. So basically you can pretty much do anything, but you got to remember that you got to put them together and pull them apart. Yeah. Yeah. And the most complicated one I did was the cavity back that we did uh, when I was at Mulrich and Todd Grahams did that for me when he was an engineer at uh, Brunswick. And we had to make multiple parts to do that one. But they try to keep it to top and bottom. We yeah. seam horizontally and we took over Ebonite who seamed vertically. So we're yep. gonna have both yep. horizontal and vertical seaming at, uh, at Brunswick once they get the uh, plant back operating again because they had to put in a whole new line, obviously, with four more balls, four more brands. Yeah. yeah. All right. So there's only Thank two you for of us left. Yeah, two. <laughs> and and some, some other small companies that we'll see what happens with them. But We'll see what happens. There's two, yeah, you're yeah, the glide. Some made overseas. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you got the ones that are made in Korea. <laughs> well, there's a small one in, in California as well. Yeah, but that's yeah. hooked up with the Koreans, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so, so they can say USA, you know? Yeah, they can say USA on them because they're shipped here. Yeah. But they're not manufactured here. Or are they? Are there some balls being made in California? Uh, from what from what I saw, yes. Okay. Putting but together I can't. a plant like Brunswick has in Reynosa, Mexico, yeah, the, that expense is enormous. Yeah, that's light years above anything I've ever seen. In Have the you ever had the chance to go down there and see it? Yeah, yeah, I, I walked through it, and it was it was amazing, amazing. It is the most modern and accurate manufacturing facility for bowling balls in the world. Yeah, yeah. I completely agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Jim Panici was president of Brunswick when they built that. And I was sitting at home in 2012 and Brian Graham called me up and said, how'd you like to make some more bowling balls? <laughs> and I worked for BG and BG's a great guy. You know him as well. You know him. Yes. Yes. Very, very yes, good. He, he's, he's, he's been around the industry. Yes, he has. He's been yes, at he Turbo, has. he's been at Columbia, he's been at the USBC, he's been at Ebonite, and guess where he is now? <laughs> he's got a lot of shirts to put in the corner. Yes, he does. He, he'd win the <laughs> prize right now. 
Jim Maylander used to, and now BG is the new Jim Maylander of shirts at the at the trade shows. He's got one from a whole lot of different places. Yeah. I just, my partner and I, we just keep doing what we do. Thank you very much for coming on, Mo. Oh, I had a great time. And, uh, awesome. You you guys uh, in New England have a good time. You guys going to get opened up soon? Uh, June twentieth, they're talking about opening up uh, most of the state. So, good luck. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. You're in a hotbed of you got a population density there that really gives you complications. And people have yeah, just got to be smart. We're going to open up, but don't yeah. do anything stupid. Yeah. For sure. And that's sure. hard to tell people because they get a little anxious and they get emotional about it. And look what happened in Minneapolis. And and just be smart about it and do it intelligently and a little bit at a time. And we'll get through this. I'm po yep. absolutely positive we're going to get through this. Yes, we but will. Yes, we just got to pace ourselves. And yep. I appreciate the time. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. If you ever want to do it again, you just let me know and we'll do it. Okay. Thank you very much. And, uh, and I'll say hi to Mr. Gillick next time I see him for you. <laughs> okay. You do that. All right. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. All right. Have a good night. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye. All right. That was Mo Pinnell, one of the key figures in the bowling industry when it comes to core design and advancing core technology. Be sure to like and follow us for the upcoming videos, and we'll see you soon.